Hello and welcome to today's lecture. Today we're lecturing on chapter 14, which is speaking to inform and speaking to persuade, the two major types of speeches that you'll be doing here with me in our class. Now I want to talk about the difference between informative speaking and persuasive speaking. So speeches are informative when they seek to describe, explain, or instruct about a non-controversial topic. Whereas persuasive speeches are trying to change your audience's mind, attitude, belief, or behavior. And it's usually on a controversial topic. So definitely know that a big difference between informative speaking and persuasive speaking. In informative speaking, you're telling, and in persuasive speaking, you're selling. So telling versus selling. So in persuasive speaking, you do have to consider that you might have three different types of persuasive speeches. A speech on the type of proposition you're trying to put forth. And these propositions can be a proposition of fact, whether you're arguing whether something is true or false. A proposition of value, where you're arguing on a value or worth of a topic. And then the final top type of proposition is a proposition of policy, whether you feel a specific action needs to be changed or done. The next type of persuasive speech, or excuse me, the, ne the next factor of persuasive speaking is that it's done incrementally. It's done over time. Persuasion is not a light switch that you can just flip on and off. It is done in stages especially think about political speeches and po political campaigns. You don't necessarily listen to a candidate speech and think, wow, I'm definitely voting for him or her. It takes repeated exposure to a message to buy into what that person is trying to promote. And then you have to know that persuasion can be ethical, but it also cannot be ethical. It depends on the speaker, but you should always aim to be ethical at all times and never try and give false information or claims to your audience to get them to agree with you. So let's talk first about informative speaking. In order to deliver an effective informative speech, you first want to define your specific purpose. And this is also known as a purpose statement. It's what you want your audience to do or to know after listening to your speech. And it stresses your audience's knowledge or ability. You also wanna make sure that you use clear and simple language. Try and do this at all times because the more complex you are and the more difficult and, and big or awkward language that you use, then you're talking down to your audience and then they're not going to feel comfortable and it's going to lower your speaker's credibility. You also want to em emphasize important points and you do this by repetition. Let's face it, this is how people learn. You don't hear something once and automatically have it ingrained in your brain. You hear it repeatedly in order to remember it. So you want to make sure that you repeat your message and you do this by in the introduction, explaining what you're gonna be talking about to your audience, in the body, getting more into detail of your main points, and then in your conclusion, restating your main points for your audience. Also, you want to generate speaker and excuse me, audience involvement as a speaker. This is important. How do you generate audience involvement? You do this by asking questions and possibly showing a demonstration, possibly inviting an audience member up during your speech if it's appropriate. There are many ways that you can generate audience involvement, but this is important because if you don't make the audience and you don't involve your audience or you don't give them a reason to care, they're not going to listen to you and they're going to tune out. So how, how can you make your audience want to listen to you? This is a very good question and, and, and definitely a challenge. Uh, you want to, in order to get your audience involved, you want to increase their level of commitment and attention. 
okay? So you wanna grab their attention in the beginning of your speech and then keep it. Now, here are three ways that are gonna make it easier for your audience to listen to you. The first is to limit the amount of information you present to them. This is important because you don't want to overwhelm your audience. We are already overwhelmed with the amount of information we receive on a daily basis. So you want to keep the information simple and easy to follow. You also want to transition from familiar information that the audience will already know to newer information that you're going to share with them about your topic. And then the final thing that you can do to make it easier for your audience to listen to you is to transition from simple to more complex information. Again, just like you're transitioning from familiar to new information, transition from simple to more complex information. And you want to do this by using signposts. Signposts are a signal or an indicator to your audience that something important is about to happen. So remember, as the speaker, you're the expert. So you are teaching your audience on what is important for them to learn. So you are gonna have not, you're gonna have in our class, you're, during your speech, you are not going to be allowed to have a question and answer period. Unfortunately, our time factors limit that. However, if you were to have a Q&A during a presentation sometime in the future, I do want to share with you four things that you should do to handle questions during a question and answer period. The first is to listen to the substance of the question and also repeat back what the question was that was asked. That's a surefire way to help you remember what, you, what question you were just asked. Also, you wanna paraphrase a confusing or possibly a quietly asked question, okay? Because you wanna make sure that you understand what's being asked of you. Also, you wanna avoid reacting defensively because that's not gonna look good for your speaker's credibility. And you also wanna briefly answer the question and then check to see if your answer was helpful, if that was what your audience member was looking for. But again, remember, for the purposes of our class, we're not gonna have time for a Q&A. So how to, how to effectively deliver a persuasive speech. Now remember, in a persuasive speech, you're trying to change your audience's mind, attitude, belief, or behavior, usually on a controversial topic. So again, the first thing you need to ask yourself is, are you trying to change your audience's attitude or are you trying to change their behavior? So these, this is a very important consideration. The first thing you wanna do in preparing your persuasive speech is you want to prepare a persuasive speech purpose statement. So this is what you want your audience to know or to be able to do after listening to your speech. You also want to adapt yourself to your specific audience. Remember, it's all about your audience. So who are they, why are they here, and why should they care? And especially in a persuasive speech, you're gonna have three different types of audience members. You're gonna have people that are for you, that are on your side, and these people are obviously easy, right? You're preaching to the choir. They already believe what you're trying to propose. Then you've got the people that are against you. This is not so easy. These are the people that are opposite stance of what you're trying to promote. You're less likely to convince them. However, you should focus your energy on your target audience. These are people also known as the swing vote, okay? They're in the center. They can lean either way. So why not grab them and get them on your side of the stance? This is where you have the most power is with your target audience. You also want to establish common ground and credibility with your audience members. If you do this, you will endear yourself to your audience and also increase your speaker's credibility. So try to do this in the beginning, uh, the introduction portion of your speech. 
And you also want to follow Aristotle's triad for balancing emotion with logic and ethics. And we're going to talk more about these three types of persuasive appeals that Aristotle has espoused. The first is logos, and logos is derived from the word logic. So you want to have solid evidence that backs up what you're trying to promote and propose to your audience. The second is ethos, and ethos is known as the speaker's credibility. The speaker's credibility is determined by the audience. So this is an extremely important aspect of your persuasive appeal. The final aspect of Aristotle's three, uh, Aristotle's triad is pathos. And pathos is derived from the word empathy or empathetic and, and emotion. Okay, so it's speaking not only to the head, but to the heart. So making your audience feel something is very important, especially in a persuasive appeal. So whether you're trying to get them to feel angry, to feel excited, to feel afraid, to feel happy, to feel sad, whatever it is, your level of leveraging your pathos is very important. So again, to summarize Aristotle's triad, you have logos, which is logic. You have ethos, which is having the audience's best interest at heart and, and building up your speaker's credibility. And then you have your pathos, which is your emotional appeal. So to effectively formulate a persuasive argument, you need to structure your argument with a problem, with a solution, and with a desired audience behavior on what you want them to do. So one possible way to do this is by using Monroe's motivated sequence, which I'm sure you're familiar with, but I'm going to give you a brief recap. So Monroe's motivated sequence is based on five steps. The first one is attention, is grabbing your audience's attention and keeping it. The second step of Monroe's is the need or the problem that needs to be solved. This, this needs to be explained to the audience before you can offer step three, which is the satisfaction or the solution to the problem. The fourth step of Monroe's is visualization. And that's a very important step because this is where you're showing the audience how their lives will be bettered or improved by them taking it taking into account into account and into action your solution and then the fifth step which is very vital is the action step what do you want your audience to do you've got to be very clear here and give them an action step to put into place so again to recap five steps of monroe's motivated sequence you've got attention need which is the problem satisfaction which is the solution visualization which is the improved or betterment of the audience life and then the fifth step which is the action so how do you bolster reasoning within your argument in a persuasive speech this is important because you've got to present evidence you've got to prevent you've got to present supporting material which the speaker will use to back up the claim being made so i want to talk about what a claim is and also what a subclaim is so a claim is ex an expressed opinion of the speaker that the the speaker would like the audience to accept so you're going to make a claim in your persuasive argument but then you're also going to have a subclaim and a subclaim is a more advanced and detailed claim that supports the overall claim so we're going to talk about this in further detail in just a moment the tolman model is used to tie the claims and evidence presented together within a warrant. So what does this mean? So let's talk about the Tolman model right now. So the Tolman model proposes that every claim a speaker gives needs to be supported with not only evidence and support, but a warrant that ties the claim and the evidence together. Okay, now a warrant 
It is a statement that justifies the use of evidence for a particular claim. And every claim, the, the point of the Tolman model is that every claim that is made has to be examined to see if it needs evidence to back it up and that all evidence used needs to be examined to see if it needs a warrant to justify it in light of the claim. So let me give you an example of the Tolman model using the topic of cigarette smoking, which we all know is dangerous to our health. So the claim made would be that cigarette smoking is dangerous to one's health. That's the claim. The evidence would be that a, you, will, you would put forth to your audience a study that found that, that, that smokers are two times as likely to develop lung cancer as non-smokers. So that would be your evidence. Smokers are twice as likely as non-smokers to develop lung cancer. And then the warrant or the, the, what you're going to use to back this up is that the study that you just shared with your audience was carefully controlled and other explanations of these findings are unlikely. Okay, so remember, Tolman's model suggests that there is a claim, there's evidence to support such claim, and then there is a warrant that is a statement that justifies the claim and the evidence being used together. So very important that you understand the Tolman model. Now, I'm going to end here with talking about fallacies. And there are six fallacies that you should avoid in persuasive statements. And this happens all the time, and it gets speakers into a lot of trouble. So the first is the attacking the person instead of the argument, which is an ad hominem attack. So it attacks the person and not the issue at hand. Politicians are famous for doing this. They get off topic, and instead of talking about the issue, they attack the speaker, which is never a good thing to do. The, section, the second fallacy is a reduction to the absurd, which is presenting information in an unfair way that that an unfairly attacks the issue in such a way that it's completely absurd and completely unbelievable. The third fallacy you should avoid is an either or fallacy, which, which proposes that if one, one item is accepted, the other item shall be rejected. So it's an either or proposition. The fourth is a false cause, which is a post hoc ergo propter hoc. This is Latin. So what that means is that one thing, one item should be, would one item, one event causes the other to happen, which because of this, this caused this to happen, which is a false cause. And then the appeal to authority, which is, uh, which is having a testimony by a celebrity. Do you think that Tiger Woods drives a Buick Enclave? Probably not, but he's shown driving one on a commercial and talking about how great it is and therefore you too should buy a Buick. So that's an example of an appeal to authority. And the last one is the bandwagon appeal, which is everybody's doing it, so you should too just jump on that bandwagon. So I have just given you six fallacies to avoid in persuasive arguments. Today we have discussed the differences between informative speaking and persuasive speaking and what you need to consider in constructing these speeches. And I hope you found today's lecture helpful. Thank you for joining me today. And I look forward to seeing you at our next lecture. Thank you for listening. <music>